Hello. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. The call for transparency is, is louder than ever. Why is that and, and why is there this demand now? Um, I think it's to do with trust. Um, I, I think in many cases people might not even understand some of the data they'll get. They don't even know they need it. But, but if you're offered a simple binary mechanism for assessing um, the reliability of your suppliers, you're going to take it. And transparency is one of those things. I mean, I'm seeing, or hearing about anyway, at least, RFPs that are being written that said, are you willing to sign up to A and other, ours, whichever one, code of transparency, as being the first filter for making it through into a selection process? Well, that's quite interesting, because it means that there is a very simple binary mechanism for, for understanding who's reliable and who isn't, which is not something the, the market really has had before. I, I quite like that. Why is it so important and why has it come to a head now? Is this about public trust? Public trust? Well, I think you know the, the space I'm operating in currently is the institutional framework. So it's about the representatives of the public, the institutional investors, uh, and, and trust um, that they may or may not have. I think information is slowly bleeding out that, in fact, the data that they've been operating on and some of the assumptions that they've made about the way in which underlying suppliers, asset managers, uh, brokers, custodians, pension fund consultants um, have been either performing or behaving um, is developing into a, uh, a, a rather complicated pattern of, of mistrust. And, and so people are looking at, at these mechanisms to try and understand who they should trust. Trust is very important. It's a very good way of deciding who you should work with. I, I prefer, it a bit, prefer it to think of it as a way in which people um, should assess who they shouldn't trust. Sometimes it's easier to paint the negative space than the positive space. And so figuring out who you shouldn't trust is just as important as trying to figure out who's performing well and matching your requirements. How do you think cost transparency will affect the industry and, and what do you think it will bring about? Um, some consolidation, and by consolidation maybe not, maybe not consolidation is the right word, but some attrition, so there'll be managers who, who find it they, are, they cannot perform anymore, they, they are not going to be uh, to have a business model anymore. So I think there'll be a, a, you know, a reduction in the number of, of managers and other suppliers. Um, but an improvement in quality, I think, is, is, is probably what will happen. Um, I think most managers, most suppliers, haven't got anything to be afraid of. When they sit back and look at their data, you know, they're, they're reasonable people. Um, I think it's trying to weed out the ones who are either willingly or unwillingly not giving the correct data. That's what we want to do. So that's why I see the market moving towards is a, a higher quality output. And identifying cost doesn't mean removing it altogether. It actually means seeking value for money. Value for money is the important point here. It's not just about cost. Cost is a litmus test. It is a litmus test. I, I get a little bit frustrated with people who say that cost should be the only indicator of, uh, of who you should work with. The constant litany of, of active versus passive, passive is the only way forward. Well, well it's not. It absolutely isn't. You've got to look at it in the round in terms of value for money. Um, and if you don't consider those issues, you'll end up writing out a, a lot of good value from, from, from companies you might consider. Um, and you have to have a, a blended portfolio. You have to. Um, so everybody needs some active, but how do you figure out which ones are good and which ones are not? Currently there isn't a mechanism. How well is this being received and adopted by the asset management world? Do you know what? Very well. It's interesting. Um, so uh, the thing that I've noticed is that, that almost once it's become inevitable, people are um, getting on board with it. What's also clear is that once it's become a, a clear indicator of quality, the willingness and capability of providing data and, and data to a comprehensive standard as and when our um, standard is released formally it's a very comprehensive standard it's very very detailed it's not easy it's complicated and yet managers are willing to do it and they're willing to sign up ahead of the time to doing it and to discuss doing it before it's even been set in stone the local government pension scheme being the case in point information out yesterday that came to me from Jeff Houston who's the deputy chair of the panel I sit on is that um, the LGPS scheme advisory board has agreed to roll their standard which was the original one that I put together about four years ago to the new IDWG standard as and when it's released and so managers signing up to their code of transparency are signing up to something that hasn't yet been set in stone and they're willing to do it because they recognise the positive impact it has on their sales. So briefly, what is the reason that asset managers are behind this and wanting to support it? Um, two reasons. One is they see it as a very good positive marketing opportunity. That has to happen. But, but like, um, 
like anybody, they don't like to see their, the name of their good industry being tarnished by those who are not willing to play, to play by the rules. I mean, it's, it's, like, um, it's like any competitive environment. If someone starts cheating, you want to get rid of them. And I think there is this feeling in the industry that now we have an opportunity to be able to get rid of those who aren't playing fair. And I think that's an extremely positive thing for them. And this could be particularly important in terms of public perception too. Absolutely, and there are a couple of elements to this. One is we want in the UK to maintain our preeminence in asset management. It is one of the most systemically important sectors in the UK. There is no doubt about that. There's no point in destroying it. We need to make it better and we need to get people in the UK to invest more. But more to the point, if we created an environment where we can hold our hands up and say the UK is the best place and safest place and most honest place to invest your money, we will attract offshore assets into the UK. And again, that's good for everybody. So very important for the future of the industry globally as well as yes. UK-wise. And there are lots of initiatives globally going on. I think there are a number of domiciles out there that have uh, similar but, but nowhere near as comprehensive standards. I mean, the, the FCA have given a massive opportunity to myself and the panel, which is the panel are from both sides, both institutional investor and asset manager supplier, for us to come together and put something very comprehensive in place. So we are a big step ahead, but I know IOPA are looking at this as well. They have a, a, a working group which I sit on in Europe looking at something similar. Uh, Australia have initiatives. Holland obviously have their own um, pensions uh, dashboard or pensions uh, cost collection framework and there are other domiciles that do so, but we are a long way ahead. But on top of that, there are a couple of other mechanisms that I could probably mention. One is the World Bank um, did a review of the Turkish market using the, the framework I put together um, for the LGPS two years ago, and they've, they've implemented a whole-scale market reform off the back of that. I, I think the World Bank will be looking at using this framework and rolling it out across their constituency. Uh, and then there are collective organizations like the Committee on Workers' Capital, um, which is the unionized pension um, fund organization globally, their talking shop, which is not 250 billion of assets, it's 15 or so trillion of assets in one room. They have put together a working group looking at cost transparency. And again, that thing is chaired and operated by somebody from the UK who's very clear about what the work that we're doing and would like to migrate that into, into their framework too. So there are lots of mechanisms where this will be pushed out globally. Now this conference has a thousand people attending, it's a fantastic opportunity to get your message out there. What yeah, do you hopefully. hope delegates take away with them? The framework that we've put together, the standard, um, might be considered one of two things. One is a best practice user guide for what you should reasonably ask for from your asset managers. So if you're a trustee sitting there going, I don't understand costs, what should I ask for? Uh, how do I know my advisors are asking the right questions? Well, we're gonna give you that toolkit. By the same token, it does something else as well. It tells the asset managers what a good standard for data submission would look like. So in other words, be prepared to give this data up and you should be prepared, institutional investors, to ask for it. So if both those voices are doing the same thing at the same time, it's gonna be pretty easy. Chris, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's been really fascinating. Uh, nice to, to meet you as well. Thank, thank you. you.